Welcome, dear viewers, to our journey through the shadows of crime. Prepare to be transported into the world of criminals, assassins, betrayals, and vendettas. Without further ado, let us delve into the abyss of human wickedness. Today, we're going to delve into another distressing case involving Lauren Hugel Mir. Lauren first encountered Matt Phelps when they were in middle school, although they weren't particularly close friends at the time. However, years later, when both Lauren and Matt were 26 years old, something unexpected occurred. Matt, who hadn't communicated with Lauren in a long time, reached out to her on Instagram. Intrigued by the unexpected request, Lauren accepted Matt's request and began following him. Intrigued back, Matt decided to delve deeper into Lauren's Instagram page. As he scrolled through her posts, he found himself liking each one. There was something about Lauren that captivated him, and he couldn't resist being drawn to her. As time went on, Lauren and Matt continued to text and talk on the phone daily. They discovered they had a lot in common, particularly their love for Harry Potter, Star Wars, and other geeky interests. Their conversations were filled with laughter and shared interests, and their friendship quickly blossomed into. Something deeper that made Matt particularly appealing to Lauren was his dedication to his faith. Lauren had grown up in a Christian household, and God held great significance in her life. She cherished the fact that Matt shared the same spiritual values, and she found solace in their shared beliefs and principles. To the outside world, Lauren and Matt appeared to be a deeply in love couple. Their relationship seemed brimming with joy and happiness, leading those around them to believe they had found their soulmates. It was only a matter of time before. Before Matt decided to pop the question to Lauren, Dale, Lauren's father, was deeply protective of his daughter. He had always been concerned about her well-being and safety, and the thought of her getting married to someone he barely knew filled him with concern. After Lauren and Matt became engaged, their loved ones threw an engagement party to celebrate their exciting news. Lauren was thrilled and dressed to the nines in a stunning white dress. However, things at the party took an unexpected turn when Matt's mother arrived dressed in white. An apparent act of disrespect towards Lauren, it was evident to everyone that Matt's mother was not pleased with her son's decision to marry Lauren. Unable to contain her frustration and disappointment, Lauren approached Matt after the engagement party to confront him about his mother's behavior. However, Matt dismissed her concerns, stating that he had grown up with his grandparents rather than his parents. Matt went on to say that he did not have the best relationship with his mother and that what she thought did not. Matter to him after becoming engaged, Lauren and Matt made the decision to relocate to Raleigh, North Carolina in 2016. Despite the change of location, they remained committed to their Christian values and continued to live a life guided by their faith, Matt was employed at an in-home care company. His hard work and commitment were recognized and he was named Employee of the Month. Lauren was incredibly proud of her husband's dedication and hard work. However, Lauren's contributions were just as significant she worked diligently too. Supporting their life together often meant taking on up to four jobs simultaneously. In addition to her full-time job at a Fortune 500 company, Lauren found ways to contribute further to their financial stability. One of her side hustles involved babysitting. Additionally, she worked in the church nursery, taking care of children while their parents attended services. Furthermore, Lauren had a side business selling candles. Her entrepreneurial spirit led her to explore various opportunities, and she was determined to succeed in whatever she pursued. In Dever, she pursued the idea of owning her own business held a particular allure for her, as it offered the potential for financial freedom and the opportunity to create something meaningful every Tuesday night. Lauren and Matt would make the trip to her parents' house for game night. It was a weekly event that they both looked forward to. Matt would always show up on time eager to spend quality time with Lauren's family. He seemed to enjoy the opportunity to bond and connect with them in November 2016. Lauren and Matt. Celebrating their love in a wedding ceremony in Wake Forest, North Carolina, their special day was filled with joy, laughter, and a touch of their shared passion for nerdy things. One of the cutest touches that made the wedding memorable was incorporating some nerdy stuff Lauren and Matt loved. 
The groomsmen, dressed in dapper suits, each holding their lightsabers, transforming the wedding into a Star Wars-themed celebration. Shortly after Matt and Lauren married, cracks started to appear in their relationship. One of the main issues was Matt's discomfort with Lauren's close friendship with a male friend from church. Matt suspected this friend had feelings for Lauren and was concerned that their friendship was too close. Lauren, however, tried to reassure Matt that she felt nothing for this man and was committed to her marriage. Matt's trust issues were rooted in his past experiences with his first marriage. He revealed that his previous spouse cheated on him while she was on a mission trip. When she finally returned home, she informed him that she never. The betrayal and abandonment left Matt deeply wounded and struggling for a long time. According to Matt, the impact of his first marriage was profound, and he described feeling emotionally messed up for an extended period. As Lauren and Matt's marriage progressed, Matt seemed increasingly unhappy. His demeanor changed from being upbeat and content to a darker and more depressed state. He appeared stuck in a dark place, and it was evident that something was weighing heavily on him. Around this time, Matt's attitude towards his faith became increasingly distant. He seemed unhappy and disengaged from attending church services with his wife. This decision was a significant blow for Lauren. As her faith was paramount to her, she felt that her husband's unwillingness to share this aspect of her life with her was like a slap in the face. Lauren couldn't help but notice that Matt seemed to disregard whatever she cherished entirely. It was as if his love and appreciation had faded away, leaving a growing void in their relationship. Lauren longed for a deeper connection with her husband built on shared values and interests, but Matt seemed disinterested. Matt started displaying signs of laziness that greatly irritated Lauren, who was working multiple jobs to support them. His pattern of finding a job, working there for a few weeks, and then abruptly quitting became a recurring issue that caused Lauren immense frustration. What particularly upset her was that Matt was spending their money at an alarming rate, leaving her struggling to earn it back. Lauren and Matt's friends and family members tried to pull him out of his depression, but their efforts seemed to fall on deaf ears instead of seeking help or engaging in meaningful activities. Matt would spend countless hours in front of the TV, engrossed in playing video games. This behavior affected his and Lauren's financial stability and strained their relationship. Lauren found herself in need of support due to Matt's unusual behavior and took action by contacting her mother and sister Lauren opened up. To them, sharing how exhausted she was working four jobs and how disheartening it was to come home from a long day and face a messy house, laundry waiting to be done, and food that needed to be prepared throughout, Matt seemed to prioritize playing video games and spending their money, leaving Lauren feeling neglected and overwhelmed. Despite the increasing distance between them and the strange behavior exhibited by Matt, Lauren remained committed to her marriage and was determined to make it work. Her dedication to their marriage was evident. Her dedication to... In her unwavering decision to stay by Matt's side, despite the challenges they faced as a couple, she remained steadfast in her belief that their marriage was worth saving. Around the time when Lauren and Matt hit their four-month wedding anniversary, their relationship was as strained as ever. One significant change that raised concerns was Matt's absence from Tuesday night game night at Lauren's family house. This decision hurt Lauren and her family and seemed intentional as they saw it as a deliberate disrespect towards them. Lauren was feeling distant from Matt and knew that something needed to change. Lauren had tried to communicate her feelings and concerns, but it seemed Matt wasn't listening or didn't care. She was concerned, learned that their marriage was drifting apart, and she didn't want to lose the love they once had at that time. Lauren was desperate to save her marriage with Matt and was willing to do anything to make it work. So when Matt proposed that he and Lauren go on a road trip to Bowling Green, Kentucky, where his uh, family lived, Lauren agreed. She thought getting away with Matt could benefit their strained relationship and hopefully get things back to how they used to be. When Lauren and Matt arrived in Bowling Green, Kentucky, they were met with a surprise. They decided to embark on a trip with Matt's mother, her husband, and his parents. However, things didn't turn out as expected. Despite arriving together, Matt's mother's feelings toward Lauren had not changed and she continued to give her a chilly reception. Matt's 
mother maintained an icy demeanor throughout the trip, causing tension within the group as the trip went on. Matt's mother arranged a photo shoot for the family, and she included Lauren Lauren was excited to be included in an ACT activity by her mother-in-law, hoping that this would mean a shift in their relationship. Several days before the photo shoot, Matt's mother texted Lauren that everyone would be wearing blue, eager to follow the instructions Lauren went shopping, and bought two new blue outfits, one for herself and one for Matt. She was looking forward to wearing the outfit she had chosen and being included in the photo shoot. However, when they arrived at the designated location, they discovered that everyone except Lauren and Matt was wearing white. Confused and disappointed, Lauren turned to Matt's mother for an explanation. However, instead of acknowledging her mistake, Matt's mother acted upset with Lauren. She began to lash out, making it seem as if it was Lauren's choice to wear blue. Frustrated by the situation, Lauren tried to explain that she had followed instructions and bought blue outfits accordingly. However, Matt's mother continued to escalate the situation, throwing a fit and cancelling the photo shoot altogether when Lauren and Matt returned from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Their relationship continued to deteriorate Matt, spending an increasing amount of time alone, writing in his journals, started displaying even more peculiar behaviour. His behaviour worried Lauren as she observed changes in her husband's demeanour. Lauren began to suspect Matt. Was stealing money from the Disney fund the couple had set aside for their future trip to Disney World. Her suspicions were heightened when she discovered that Matt might have also taken money from her purse without her knowledge. Lauren would often call her mother crying during this time when she suspected Matt of stealing money from their vacation fund and her purse. She once told her mother that she only had enough money to cover the bills for one month and didn't have any more. This revelation left Lauren anxious and afraid as she knew she and Matt were facing a significant financial challenge. Less than a year before they started their life together, Lauren and Matt entered their marriage with $10,000 in savings, which they believed would be a solid foundation for their future. However, by this point in their marriage, Lauren and Matt had found themselves in financial instability. Despite their initial optimism, they had managed to deplete their savings significantly. Matt's excessive spending quickly drained their financial resources. One evening, Lauren arrived home from a long day of work and texted Matt about their dinner plans for that night. During the conversation, she also mentioned that a female co-worker had visited their house earlier in the day. This woman's visit sparked concern in Lauren, given the strained state of her marriage to Matt. Lauren couldn't help but wonder if she should be nervous that a woman had sought out her husband at their home. Her unease grew as she contemplated the truth behind Matt's first marriage. Driven by her curiosity and desire to uncover the truth, she decided to delve deeper into this matter. Matt and his first wife, Brooke Truitt, met in college and were college sweethearts. After dating for two years, Matt proposed to Brooke and they soon married. However, Brooke would later say that Matt cheated early in their relationship and Matt confessed to Brooke that he had kissed another girl. Although hurt, Brooke eventually forgave Matt. The second time Matt cheated on Brooke was right before they were married. That time Matt begged Brooke for forgiveness and she eventually forgave him and married him. After Matt and Brooke married, their relationship quickly became strained. Brooke later accused Matt of spending money on stuff they didn't have the money for. Meanwhile, she was the one working 40 hours a week to support them. The constant strain in their marriage took a toll on Matt and Brooke's relationship. They grew distant and found themselves drifting apart emotionally. Eventually, Matt and Brooke divorced in a shocking revelation Lauren informed her parents that she discovered it was Matt, rather than his ex-wife, who cheated on his first marriage. Her family, filled with anger and a sense of betrayal, were afraid of what Lauren's protective father might do to Matt if they told him the truth. As a result, they remained silent and kept the news to themselves. As Lauren and Matt's marriage continued to deteriorate, Lauren's frustration with her husband grew exponentially. The discovery of yet another betrayal shattered their already fragile trust. Just when Lauren thought she could rebuild her faith in their marriage, she discovered that Matt had again broken her trust regarding their finances. 
Upon receiving their latest credit card statement, she found that Matt had splurged $11,200 on video games and another $1,100 on gift cards. These impulsive purchases made without Lauren's knowledge or consent only deepened her frustration and fueled her doubts about Matt's commitment to their marriage. Despite Matt's continuous breach of trust, Lauren was determined to do everything in her power to save her. Marriage divorce did not even enter Lauren's realm of possibilities as she was committed to making things work as a result. She decided to plan an intervention with her mother and sister to confront Matt about his excessive spending habits during the intervention, Lauren, her mother and her sister aimed to assist in developing a plan to address his and Lauren's budget. Matt exhibited a positive outlook and genuinely desired to rectify his and Lauren's financial issues, he seemed genuinely committed to making positive. Changes in their marriage were evident. On August 31st, 2017, the same woman who Matt used to work with suddenly appeared at Lauren and Matt's front door. Lauren was caught off guard and upset to see this woman as things had been going well between her and Matt. Matt informed Lauren that he was leaving with her, explaining that she needed his assistance with something. Lauren was furious with Matt for this decision and began frantically texting and calling him. However, Matt remained silent and did not answer her calls or texts. In her fury, Lauren turned to her sister and vented her frustrations. She expressed her belief that Matt was ruining her life and told her sister that it was over between them. Lauren also mentioned that she had informed Matt about her decision to end their relationship. In the early hours of September 1st, 2017, a 911 call came into a dispatcher, and on the other line was Matt Phelps. Matt told the dispatcher, I think I killed my wife. I had a dream and then I turned on the lights and she's dead on the floor. I have blood all over me and there's a bloody knife on the bed. And I think I did it. She's not moving. Oh my God, I'm so scared she didn't deserve this. His Matt was trembling with fear and panic as he spoke to the dispatcher. He sounded unsure of himself. His voice filled with shock and guilt during the phone call with the 911 dispatcher, Matt explained the reason he might have killed his wife, according to Matt. He had taken coracidin cough and cold medicine and may have taken more than he should have. Matt stated that he took the Corin medication because he knew it could. To provide relief and help him sleep better at night, coracidin is an over-the-counter medication commonly used to treat common cold and flu symptoms. It contains a combination of antihistamines, decongestants, and pain relievers, which relieve nasal congestion, cough, and sore throat. However, coracidin has also been associated with certain side effects, including drowsiness, dizziness, and confusion. These effects can be more pronounced when taken in large amounts or combined with other medications. Minutes after Matt called 911 to report that he had killed his wife, the Raleigh Police Department arrived at the scene of their home. Upon their arrival, they found Matt standing on the front steps. The officers promptly took him into custody, ensuring he was safe and secure. Once inside the house, the officers discovered a horrifying scene in the master bedroom. Lauren was found in the fetal position, lifeless on the bedroom floor. This scene was gruesome, with blood splattered all over the carpet, walls, comforter and bed. Even for the most seasoned police officers, the sight was deeply disturbing the overwhelming amount of blood and Lauren's lifeless body painted a horrific picture crime scene. Investigators arrived to begin their meticulous task of collecting every piece of evidence they meticulously examined every corner of the house, searching for clues that could provide insight into the events that unfolded that night. The investigators meticulously documented the scene, taking photographs, collecting samples, and gathering any physical items that appeared to be related to the crime as. The crime scene investigators continued their search for evidence in Matt and Lauren's house. Police officers had to make the difficult decision to travel to Lauren's family house and inform them that their beloved daughter was dead. Upon knocking on the door, the officers received a response from Lauren's mom, who asked if there was anything wrong with Lauren. The officer somberly replied, yes, there is. With her heart pounding, Lauren's mom pressed further, asking if her daughter was dead. The officer once again answered yes. She is overcome with emotion. 
she dared to ask the most important question, did Matt kill Lauren with a heavy heart? The officer confirmed her suspicion, uttering yes he did after receiving the news that her mother had been killed by her husband, Lauren's sister, was awoken by the sound of her mother's piercing screams filled with shock and horror. Whore, she raced down the stairs upon reaching the bottom of the steps. The police officers stood by the front door and confirmed her worst nightmare. Her sister was dead at the... At the police station, Matt was questioned by the police regarding his involvement in the murder of his wife. But Matt eventually decided to request an attorney, halting the questioning. Once Matt made this request and the police took action, they transported Matt to the hospital to undergo a blood test to determine if he was under the influence of Coracidin at the time of the murder. Following the blood test, Matt was transported to the county jail where he was arrested for murder. After Matt's arrest, the police conducted a thorough examination of his journals and electronic items to determine if they could find any additional evidence pointing towards his motive for murdering his wife. While searching through his internet records, the officers noticed a peculiar pattern in the weeks leading up to Lauren's death. Matthew had been researching topics related to coricidin and the effects of mixing it with alcohol. Police discovered the existence of a secret Instagram account belonging to Matt, where they found numerous posts related to death. The Devil and the infamous movie American Psycho. These posts depicted violent anti-Christian imagery that seemingly contradicted the public image Matt projected of himself. He portrayed himself as an aspiring pastor in public. The toxicology report for Matt came in and it was revealed that had a small amount of cold medication in his system. However, it was not at the toxic level that would have caused hallucinations. This discovery provided additional evidence supporting the argument that Matt was lucid and not under the influence of any substances. At, at the time of Lauren's death, Lauren's autopsy report revealed she was asleep on her side when Matt entered the room and stabbed her. After stabbing her once on her side, Matthew proceeded to roll over Lauren and stabbed her multiple times in her face. The autopsy findings also indicated that Lauren fought to save her life. Several wounds were found on her arms, suggesting that she attempted to defend herself. In total, Lauren sustained 123 stab wounds. On October 5, 2018, Matthew Phelps pleaded guilty to the first-degree murder. Wife, Lauren. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. During his sentencing hearing, Phelps addressed his former in-laws, expressing remorse and regret for his crime. Matt acknowledged what he had done, expressing his overwhelming feelings of guilt and shame. He referred to himself as a monster and emphasized that his actions were senseless and mindless, lacking any rational justification. Lauren's mother told the court, Lauren was beautiful inside and out. The actions of Matthew James Phelps had forever changed me. Welcome to True Crime X, the channel dedicated to crimes, murders, and assassins. Today, we will delve into another chilling case. Today's story serves as a poignant reminder of the fragility of life and the devastating impact of senseless actions. Let this tragedy be a call for compassion and guide collective efforts to prevent such pain from affecting more families. Emily Longley was born on February 22, 1994, in a London hospital. He was the first child in the young family of Mark and Caroline Longley. Mark's friends teased him about becoming a father early at 26. He felt completely unprepared for fatherhood. He was present at the moment of birth, and when the nurse cleaned the newborn and gave him to her, she held him tenderly in her arms, his little head resting in her palms, his legs just reaching his elbow. The girl opened her eyes and stared at her father. At that moment, Mark knew that fatherhood would not be a problem for him. A few years later, the Longley family welcomed a second daughter, Hannah. The two blonde sisters adored each other and were a joy to their father, who was sure that keeping them warm and safe would let them know how much he loved them. The girls grew up surrounded by the unconditional love of their parents and had an example of prosperity and happiness before their eyes. Mark Longley worked as a journalist for a local newspaper, while Caroline was a teacher. The girls had a promising future ahead of them, the kind of future every parent wants for their children. Ten years later, Emily and Hannah Longley's world was turned upside down when their parents made the monumental decision to move from their hometown of Bournemouth to the picturesque landscapes of New Zealand. This was a huge change for everyone, as moving to another country was a significant step. 
This difficult decision was made for the sake of Emily's health, following her doctor's advice that a change of climate was needed. The Longley family embarked on a journey to the other side of the world, hoping for a better life for their daughters, and so it was. New Zealand's climate is diverse due to its landscape. Most regions of New Zealand have a temperate maritime climate, characterized by four distinct seasons. Winters here are relatively mild and summers surprisingly cool, thanks to the influence of the Pacific Ocean and mountain ranges. The nature and air were perfect for the family from England, thus opening a new chapter in the lives of the Longleys and their daughters. Emily began attending a prestigious private school and life continued peacefully for a while, until she was metaphorically stabbed in the back by her old classmates. Emily's friend, Sarah Lee Turblanche, started a riot at school by revealing that Emily had associated with the wrong crowd and had been involved with banned substances. Sarah gave an interview to the school newspaper, describing in detail a party held at Emily's house. Despite initial disappointments and betrayals, at the end of 2010, Emily made the decision to return to England to continue her education. He moved in with his grandparents Ronald and Zoe Longley, who lived in a large detached cottage near the promenade in Southbourne, near Bournemouth, and enrolled in a British college, hoping it would be a new start to his life. This decision proved fruitful. After struggling in school, Emily found a more peaceful student life and thrived. She made considerable progress which allowed her to balance her studies at Brockenhurst College, Hampshire, with a job at the clothing store Top Shop. At just 16 years old, Emily Longley was a vibrant, cheerful, and highly ambitious young woman with striking blonde beauty. Her radiant appearance quickly led to early successes in the modeling industry, while her captivating charm and irresistible charisma made her stand out in her community. In December 2010, during a party, Emily met Elliot Vince Turner, a 19-year-old young man. Elliot was the only son of a wealthy and successful jeweler, Lee Turner, who ran his father's jewelry shop in Bournemouth, living in the luxurious family home in Queen's Park, an affluent area of Bournemouth. He was part of a group known as The Firm, made up of wealthy young men who actively frequented local bars and clubs in Bournemouth and Poole. Elliot Turner, who attracted the attention of many women, seemed almost obsessed with them. However, the two quickly became a couple. Elliot was incredibly devoted to his girlfriend, who had started modeling and earning her first money, but began to arouse the envy of many men. Elliot's jealousy towards Emily was intense, and within four months, their relationship turned into a battleground characterized by constant arguments and mutual complaints. Amid this tumultuous relationship, characterized by Elliot's troubling behavior and endless jealousy, emotional abuse became the norm. If he didn't approve of her outfit, he would accuse Emily of dressing like a prostitute. He hacked into her Facebook account to monitor her activities and conversations, showed up unannounced when she wasn't there, and used his strength and anger to intimidate Emily. On one occasion, he wrote her a note saying stop being so aggressive, however each episode was followed by regrets and apologies, only to repeat the cycle. Elliot eventually crossed the line from verbal threats to physical actions. He grabbed her by the throat and hit her in public multiple times. He then justified his actions by blaming Emily for his uncontrolled emotional outbursts. After constant arguments and fights, Emily began to fear for her life. He decided to take a break and went on holiday to his parents in New Zealand. That was the Longley family's best Easter holiday. The parents, Hannah and Emily, spent time together like in the old days. They walked a lot, laughed and spent a lot of time together, as if sensing an imminent farewell. When she said goodbye to her father, he hugged her tightly, and she promised to return in September for the Rugby World Cup. Already on the plane, he wrote his father a message. It was so nice to see you, I love you. That was the last time the family saw Emily alive. She returned to the UK intending to end her relationship with Elliot, but this tragically came at the cost of the life of a promising young woman. Elliot did not welcome his girlfriend with flowers, but with new accusations and arguments. Before Emily returned from New Zealand, Elliot discovered photos of Emily with two shirtless young men on social media. Furious with jealousy, he invited her to spend the night at his house despite the disagreement. Emily agreed to return to Elliot's family home to discuss their problems, comforted by the presence of Lee and Anita, Elliot's parents. However, upon arriving home, a horde of jealousy and insults descended upon her. The young couple argued a lot. Half an hour of shouting was followed by silence. On the morning of May 7, 2011, emergency services received a call reporting that Emily Longley, 17, had been found unconscious in bed. 
Anita Turner contacted emergency services after discovering the girl in her son's room. However, rescuers at the scene were unable to declare his death. Neighbors observed Turner sitting in the ambulance with his head in his hands after the girl's death. Elliot Turner was immediately arrested following Emily's death, but later released on bail pending an investigation. The investigation began after the tragic accident. Turner Jr., haunted by guilt, wrote a confession while his parents, determined not to lose their only child, decided to deliberately withhold crucial evidence, thus delaying the investigation. Anita Turner, 51, and Lee Turner, 53, removed a coat worn by her son on the night of the incident from their home, retrieved the confession letter from his pocket, and soaked it in bleach to destroy vital evidence. During the investigation, it was decided to secretly place listening devices in the Turner's sprawling family home. From May 18 to June 14, police secretly recorded conversations inside the Turner residence. After obtaining evidence of a family argument regarding evidence manipulation and concerns about lying to police, authorities seized the family's computers to search for more evidence and found it. An analysis of his browser search history revealed searches related to death by strangulation and how to avoid a murder charge. The following July, all three family members were arrested and charged with involvement in the incident and intentionally concealing evidence. Elliot Turner denied his involvement, blaming Emily for his troubles. During a forensic reconstruction of the incident, it was established that a fight had broken out between Elliot and Emily that fateful day. Elliot used force in an attempt to suppress her, pressing her face into the bed with a pillow. He subsequently threw the pillow away and continued to strangle her with his hands. When he fell silent, he coolly stood up and left the room. Pathologists who examined Emily's body found injuries consistent with strangulation. Elliot had scratches on his arm, and Emily's DNA was found on his fingers, indicating a physical altercation between them. During the trial, it emerged that Elliot's behavior towards Emily was characterized by threats, aggression, violence, control, and possessiveness. These alarming traits intensified, and on one fateful night in May 2011, a heated argument broke out between the couple over Emily's choice of clothing and her photos with unknown men. The wealthy family could not afford to lose their son and ruin their reputation, so they hired lawyers to fiercely defend Elliot. The defense attempted to downplay the perpetrator's role in the young woman's death by suggesting that Emily may have used drugs. However, Dorset police commissioned an independent toxicology test, which found no drugs or other prohibited substances in the victim's bloodstream. The wealthy jeweler and his wife were responsible for disposing of evidence in an attempt to hide the fact that their jealous son had ended the young New Zealand model's life, were also convicted and imprisoned. They received a 27-month sentence for misleading authorities about the incident and for destroying a confession letter written by their son, as the investigation involved a murder. The police retained Emily's body, and only in September it was possible to bring it home, but in a sealed coffin. The Turner couple were released in 2013, although Turner's appeal for a reduced sentence was rejected that same year. However, during hearings at the Supreme Court in London, the British judges made a different decision. As time passed, due to his wounded pride, it is evident that Elliot had harbored thoughts of ending his life, culminating in his death. Chief Justice Royce said in his verdict that Emily's death was a clear case of domestic violence. After hearing her sentence, Elliot said, I didn't mean to hurt her. I was just trying to defend myself. Emily Longley's attacker, Elliot Turner, is currently serving a life sentence in a Kent prison for brutally taking the budding young model's life. The court ruled he will not be eligible for parole for at least 16 years. Despite being behind bars, the Daily Star reports that Turner has adorned the walls of his prison cell with photos of Emily, suggesting a disturbing and potentially obsessive connection with his victim. Worryingly, while in prison, Turner talks eagerly about the day he will be released, expressing a desire to return to a lifestyle of champagne, Bentleys, and girls. This attitude raises serious questions about his lack of remorse and potential for continued harmful behavior after release. Furthermore, the involvement of Elliot's parents, Lee and Anita Turner, in attempting to obstruct justice by destroying their son's confession letter and manipulating evidence at the crime scene, led to their own incarceration. This highlights the gravity of the case and the collective impact of the Turner family's actions in seeking justice for Emily Longley. After the dust of the trial settled, Emily's father began to explore the topic of domestic violence through patterns and behaviors. It painted a portrait of Elliot as a tormentor, who constantly had thoughts of ending Emily's life, and it was only a matter of time. 
Loving someone is not about trying to control their life, not calling someone denigrating names, and not isolating someone from their friends. This is not love. Treating a woman like a trophy, such relationships are only for the benefit of the man. From Emily's father's memory, Elliot was cruel to Emily before she returned to New Zealand, but he didn't tell us anything. I don't know why, but things might be different now if he had spoken up. Now, I no longer think about Turner or his family. He is in prison, and I hope he suffers every day. If I dwell too much on what he did, the anger builds, and it's the kind of anger that can consume you. He never considered the people who loved, protected, and educated Emily for 17 years. He got behind her, wrapped his arms around her neck, and ended her life. Even now, years later, it's still hard to believe that someone could do this to Emily. After suffering the tragedy, Emily's parents divorced. But to this day, all anniversaries and birthdays are very difficult for them. Easter is especially difficult because it was the last time the family spent together. On May 6, 2011, Emily was still alive, engaged in a Facebook conversation with her father just hours before the accident. He seemed normal, happy, without the slightest hint of fear. However, everything changed on May 7. A phone call woke Emily's father. He initially didn't respond, but when he fully woke up, he realized he had received several missed calls from his ex-wife Caroline and many messages on his cell phone. While texts from her were not unusual, the volume of calls and texts was alarming. Finally, he answered an incoming call, only to be confronted by his youngest daughter Hannah, crying desperately on the other end of the line. In the background, he could hear his ex-wife screaming, Emily is gone, Emily is gone. He sat on the same couch that Emily had sat on just a week ago and felt broken inside. What were you planning to do after graduation? This couldn't be true. How could the girl who was so full of life have disappeared? He couldn't remember anything else about that night. Emily's father didn't sleep until he got on the plane to England. He recalls, I remember being driven to Auckland, stopping in a small town for fuel and seeing Emily's picture on the front page of the Herald. I thought I was going to vomit there in the station reading the headline. At the airport, people threw their copies in the bin and I wanted to tell them who she was, that they should keep that newspaper. It seemed like an eternity before Mark arrived in England. He was still in shock and couldn't believe the reason for his visit to his one beloved England's time was to identify his beloved daughter Emily. They immediately took him to the morgue where Emily's body was. He found himself in a room with Caroline, a police officer, and the mortuary attendant who pointed to a window and said the body was in the next room. The mortuary attendant pointed to the window, the light came on, and when they were ready, they could enter the room. The light came on and Mark and Caroline, their hands cold with horror, stood helpless at the doorway of the room. They were ready to scream that she wasn't their daughter, but she was their Emily. She was lying on the bed covered with a purple sheet. It almost looked like she was sleeping. Her father came over and touched her face. She had a beautiful alabaster color and her skin was smooth but icy. From Emily's father's recollections, I wanted to run away and pretend I hadn't seen him, but I stood there holding her hand, looking at the face I'd watched so intently when she was born. Except now her eyes were closed, and I realized that it wasn't a joke. She wasn't going to sit back and say boo. Emily, my daughter, was missing. In moments of such horror, all tomorrows become yesterdays. It's when an avalanche of emotions hits, bombarding and overwhelming your soul that you realize your complete helplessness. That day in the morgue was the last time her parents saw their Emily. Grieving the loss of someone doesn't get easier, time doesn't heal, it just teaches you to live with it. Everyone always and still talks about how beautiful Emily was, he had a wonderful, warm and loving side to his nature. She would pull you closer, wrap her long arms around you and hug you tight, but most of all, her family misses the woman Emily could have become. They will never see how her life would have unfolded, a life that was denied to her. Now, years later, Emily's father has remarried, has a wonderful wife, Hillary, and a beautiful son, Hunter, growing up in their family. Emily's younger sister, Hannah, graduated from college and created her own life, in which domestic violence has no place. Their biggest regret is that their Emily isn't here to share the joyful moments with them. Subscribe to our channel, help us grow in the world of crime stories. Your support will help us determine new cases, new stories that may shock you. Leave your comment and like this story. Welcome to this video dedicated to a criminal story of Christine Rossum, a compelling case that has captured the attention of many for its complexity and dramatic implications. 
In this story, we will create a crime documentary. Follow our channel to get more updates and new crime stories. Christine Rossum was born on October 25, 1975 in Tennessee, USA, but spent her childhood in California and Virginia. Growing up, Christine had many experiences that shaped her life in unpredictable ways. As a young woman, Christine faced challenges and temptations common to adolescents. With two brothers in tow, he lived in different cities due to his father's itinerant job. However, her life took a significant turn when she entered an all-girls boarding school. Here, Christine began to explore rebellious behaviors, such as drinking beer and smoking cigarettes, marking the beginning of a turbulent phase of her youth. Continue following me to discover how Christine Rossum's life took an unexpected direction and the events that brought her to the center of one of the most discussed cases of recent years. Throughout her life, Christine Rossum crossed numerous destinies, but none were more significant than that with Gregory de Villers. In 1995, while in San Diego, Christine's life took a major turn when she met Gregory. It seemed their paths had crossed at a crucial moment, bringing with it the promise of a bright future. After four years of knowing and growing together, in 1999, Christine and Gregory decided to take the big step, saying their wedding vows and joining their lives in marriage. But their love story, which seemed to be a tale of hope and rebirth, would soon turn into a tragic tangle of events that would turn their lives upside down and shake the surrounding community. Stay with us to discover how Christine and Gregory's fates became entwined in an intricate labyrinth of mystery and tragedy. After her marriage to Gregory de Villers, Christine Rossum embarked on a professional career that took her life on a new path. After graduating summa cum laude from San Diego State University in 1998, Christine decided to pursue the field of toxicology. Her passion for science and desire to make a difference led her to work in the City of San Diego Medical Examiner's Office. Here, Christine put her skills acquired during her studies to good use, investigating cases that often involved drugs, poisons, and other toxic agents. Despite the challenges and responsibilities of her job, Christine has demonstrated extraordinary dedication to her role as a toxicologist. His determination to provide accurate, scientifically-based answers has helped shed light on many intricate cases and has earned him respect within the forensic community. However, fate would soon present Christine with an even greater challenge than she had ever imagined. Continue following us to discover how his professional career was intertwined with the events that would change the course of his life forever. In the dark of the night of November 6, 2000, Christine and Gregory's quiet residence in San Diego, California, was rocked by an emergency call that would change the course of their lives forever. At 9.22 a.m., Christine Rossum frantically dialed 911, her voice uncertain and her heart filled with anguish. Despair spread through the phone line as Christine told the dispatcher that her beloved husband, Gregory de Villers, was not breathing. When paramedics and police arrived on the scene, they found themselves faced with a horrifying picture. Gregory lay motionless on the bed, lifeless. A feeling of dread and bewilderment permeated the room as Christine desperately fought to remain calm and face the tragic reality before her. As the investigation began to unravel the details of that fateful night, the truth behind Gregory de Villers' death remained shrouded in mystery. Stay tuned as we explore the events that began a spiral of darkness and suspicion, turning a love story into a tragedy shrouded in a shadow of doubt. The death of Gregory de Villers has left behind an aura of mystery and suspicion, fueling speculation and unanswered questions. The circumstances surrounding his death have been murky and ambiguous from the beginning, giving rise to conflicting theories and controversial hypotheses. The image of Gregory found lifeless on his bed, surrounded by rose petals and crumpled diary pages, fueled the imaginations of those trying to understand what really happened that fateful night. The presence of fentanyl in his system added another layer of complexity to the case, triggering questions about how this powerful opioid substance ended up in his body and whether it was administered deliberately or accidentally. 
As the investigation continued to uncover details, the truth behind Gregory de Villers' death seemed to steadily slip out of reach, shrouded in a veil of mystery and uncertainty. Stay with us as we explore the intricate facets of this story and try to shed light on the secrets buried beneath the surface in hopes of revealing the truth behind the mysterious circumstances surrounding his death. In the turbulent scenario surrounding the death of Gregory de Villers, the shadows of suspicion have also lengthened over Christine Rossum, his wife and toxicologist. The emergence of evidence of possible substance abuse and the suggestion of an extramarital affair have cast a sinister light on the figure of Christine, raising questions about her involvement in the tragedy that occurred that fateful night. Suspicions of an overdose arose when Gregory was found to have a lethal dose of fentanyl, a powerful synthetic opioid in his system. This led to the question of how the substance ended up in his body and whether Christine had a role in its administration. In addition, the revelation of Christine's extramarital affair with a colleague cast further shadows on her. This relationship raised doubts about Christine's motives and led to speculation about possible motives for her involvement in Gregory's death. As events unfold, the case turns into a complex web of intrigue, betrayal and suspicion, with Christine at the center of a storm of controversy and doubt. Stay tuned as we explore the intricate dynamics of this story and try to shed light on the mystery surrounding Christine's suspected overdose and extramarital affair in hopes of revealing the truth behind these dark secrets. In the chaos of the investigation into the death of Gregory de Villers, one of the most sinister elements to emerge from the crime scene was the presence of rose petals scattered around his limp body. This macabre detail added an aura of distorted romance to the tragic scene, suggesting an element of dark and mysterious symbolism. The arrangement of rose petals, along with the presence of a wedding photo and crumpled diary pages, has fueled speculation and theories about the meaning behind these seemingly innocuous details. Some have speculated that the rose petals may have represented some sort of funeral ritual or a final gesture of distorted affection while others have suggested that they may have been deliberately placed to simulate a suicide. In addition to the rose petals, other gory details added a disturbing atmosphere to the crime scene, including the presence of toxic substances in Gregory's system and the discovery of an extramarital affair by his wife, Christine Rossum. These elements have shed further light on an already complex picture and fueled speculation on possible motives behind Gregory's death. As investigations continued, the truth behind the discovery of the rose petals and other gory details continued to elude, shrouded in a veil of mystery and uncertainty. Stay with us as we explore the hidden darkness of this story and try to shed light on the secrets buried beneath the surface in hopes of revealing the truth behind the discovery of rose petals and other gory details. In the chaos of the investigation into the death of Gregory de Villers, a series of sinister clues began to point towards his wife, Christine Rossum, as possibly responsible for the tragic event. One of the main clues that raised suspicions was the presence of fentanyl in Gregory's system, a very powerful synthetic opioid. The fact that Christine had access to this substance in her work as a toxicologist has raised questions about her possible involvement in the administration of this lethal drug. Furthermore, the discovery of Christine's extramarital affair added another layer of complexity to the case, fueling suspicions about possible motives behind her alleged criminal action. The combination of an extramarital affair and the fear of discovery may have provided a motive to eliminate Gregory. The crime scene, with rose petals scattered around Gregory's body and other compromising evidence, added weight to the hypothesis that Christine might have been involved in her husband's death. The way the scene was staged, along with the revealing details that emerged from the investigation, helped create a disturbing picture that pointed toward Christine's guilt. As time passed, more and more clues began to emerge, all converging towards a single conclusion, that Christine Rossum may have been involved in her husband's death. As investigators continued to gather evidence and examine details, the case became increasingly complex, leaving many unanswered questions. 
Stay with us as we explore the intricate dynamics of this story and try to shed light on the mysteries surrounding the clues that point to Christine as responsible in hopes of revealing the truth behind these dark secrets. The tragic death of Gregory de Villers has shaken the community and led to enormous pressure to find the culprit behind this dark mystery. In the turbulent scenario of the investigation, the focus of the investigators quickly focused on his wife, Christine Rossum. With evidence seemingly pointing overwhelmingly toward her, Christine was charged with first-degree murder, a very serious charge that carries the possibility of a life sentence. Investigators argued that Christine had the means, motive and opportunity to commit Gregory's murder. Her work as a toxicologist would have provided her with access to lethal substances, such as the fentanyl found in Gregory's system, while her extramarital affair could have provided a motive to eliminate her husband. The crime scene, with rose petals, crumpled diary pages and other compromising details, was presented as evidence of his alleged guilt, suggesting that Gregory's death may have been planned and staged to look like a suicide. The first-degree murder charge threw Christine into a spiral of anguish and despair as she desperately tried to defend herself from these serious charges. As the trial approached and evidence was presented in court, Christine's fate hung on the scales of justice as the world watched intently to see if the truth behind Gregory's death would finally be revealed. Stay with us as we explore the gripping drama of this trial and seek to shed light on the mysteries surrounding the first-degree murder charges against Christine Rossum in hopes of revealing the truth behind these dark secrets. The trial that followed the first-degree murder charges against Christine Rossum began a legal drama full of tension, emotion, and an intricate web of evidence and testimony. Christine's defense attempted strenuously to counter the charges, presenting a series of arguments and counter-arguments to support their client's innocence. One of the central points of the defense's argument was that the evidence against Christine was based on hypotheses and suppositions rather than on concrete evidence. They highlighted the lack of direct evidence linking Christine to her husband's death, stressing that the presence of fentanyl in Gregory's system was not enough to prove that Christine was responsible. Furthermore, the defense raised doubts about the circumstances of Gregory's death, arguing that it could have been an accident or even suicide. They suggested that Christine's extramarital affair may have provoked a marital crisis that led to Gregory's death without any direct involvement of Christine. The defense also questioned the credibility of the evidence presented by the prosecution, pointing to inconsistencies in witness accounts and the absence of physical or scientific evidence directly confirming Christine's guilt. As the trial continued, the defense continued to reiterate Christine's right to a fair trial and the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, stressing that guilt should be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Despite the defense's efforts, the final verdict would be left to the jury, which would have to decide whether Christine was guilty or innocent of the first-degree murder charges. Stay with us as we explore the breathtaking developments of this trial and seek to shed light on the mystery surrounding Christine Rossum's defense arguments in hopes of revealing the truth behind these dark secrets. After a court trial that held the public in suspense, the jury returned its verdict. Christine Rossum was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This sentence marked a tragic epilogue in an event that shook the community and shattered many lives. However, Christine's legal fight did not end with the guilty verdict. She and her legal team have filed several appeal attempts seeking to challenge the jury's decision and shed light on alleged irregularities in the trial. The appeals raised a number of issues, including gaps in the evidence presented by the prosecution, possible interference in the chain of custody of evidence, and alleged violations of Christine's constitutional rights during the trial. The defense argued that Christine had not received a fair trial and that there were serious doubts about the strength of the evidence linking her to the crime. They insisted that Christine's presumption of innocence had not been respected and that her guilt had not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. However, despite the efforts of the defense, the appeal attempts did not lead to the desired result. The courts rejected the appeals, upholding Christine's conviction and maintaining her life sentence. 
This verdict marked the end of a long legal battle for Christine Rossum and left many unanswered questions about the truth behind Gregory de Villers' death. A feeling of bewilderment and desperation remains as the family and friends of both protagonists try to come to terms with this tragic story. As time passes, the case of Christine Rossum remains a compelling story of love, betrayal and justice that will continue to spark discussion and stir mixed emotions in the memories of those who followed her closely. Christine Rossum's case was marred by a series of errors in the legal process and new evidence that emerged during appeal attempts, casting further doubt on her conviction. During the original trial, several procedural errors and omissions emerged that raised concerns about the validity of the verdict. Questions have been raised over the chain of custody of evidence, with accusations of a lack of transparency and possible contamination of samples. Furthermore, some key witnesses provided contradictory or unreliable testimony, calling into question the strength of the evidence presented by the prosecution. During the appeals, Christine's defense presented new evidence that had not been considered during the original trial. This evidence included additional testimony, more in-depth forensic analysis, and scientific expert reports that called into question the interpretation of the evidence presented by the prosecution. In particular, new information has emerged about the presence of fentanyl in Gregory's system, raising questions about its source and the circumstances of his death. Errors in toxicology tests and discrepancies in medical reports were identified, which fueled further doubts about Christine's guilt. Furthermore, conflicts of interest and alleged violations of Christine's constitutional rights were highlighted during the original trial, raising concerns about the fairness and fairness of the judicial proceedings. However, despite the presentation of this new evidence and the defense's arguments, the appeals did not lead to a significant change in the sentencing verdict. The justice system stood by its original decision, leaving Christine still in prison and the truth about Gregory de Villers' death still shrouded in a shadow of doubt. There remains a sense of frustration and injustice as the search for the truth continues, with the hope that one day new evidence or new testimony may emerge that will finally bring to light the hidden truth behind this intricate court case. The death of Gregory de Villers has profoundly shaken his family, leaving behind a painful void and a series of unanswered questions. Gregory's parents, relatives and friends, reacted with shock and grief to the news of his sudden and mysterious passing. For the de Villers family, the search for the truth about Gregory's death has become a personal mission. They put pressure on the authorities to conduct a thorough investigation and ensure justice was done for their beloved son and brother. The discovery of alleged irregularities in the trial and new evidence that emerged during appeals has added a new dimension to their fight for justice. They strongly supported the need for a full review of the case and continued to demand answers to questions that remained unanswered. Meanwhile, the legal consequences of Gregory's death have had a lasting impact on those involved. Christine Rossum was convicted of first-degree murder and received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. This conviction marked the end of her freedom and had a devastating impact on her life and the lives of those close to her. Additionally, Gregory's family took legal action against the relevant authorities, accusing the county of negligence for allowing Christine to have access to drugs that could have caused Gregory's death. After years of legal battles, they were awarded significant civil compensation, although no amount of money can ever truly compensate for the loss of a loved one. The reactions of the Devilers family and the legal consequences of Gregory's death continue to highlight the devastating impact such a tragic crime can have on everyone involved. As time passes, the search for truth and the desire for justice persist, bringing with it the hope that one day the truth will fully emerge, bringing a sense of closure and peace to those who have lost so much. After years of investigations, court trials and appeals, the case of Christine Rossum and the death of Gregory de Villers appear to have been solved, but the long-term implications continue to raise questions and debate. Christine's conviction of first-degree murder brought a sense of closure for many, 
But for others, questions remain about her guilt and the circumstances that led to Gregory's death. Questions about the chain of evidence, conflicting testimony, and alleged irregularities in the trial continue to haunt those trying to understand the truth behind this tragic event. The long-term implications of the case extend even beyond Christine and Gregory's story. The case has raised concerns about the safety and integrity of forensic laboratories, highlighting the need for more rigorous evidence custody procedures and tighter quality controls to ensure the reliability of evidence presented in court. Furthermore, the case highlighted the complexity of human relationships and the devastating consequences that can arise from drug abuse, hopelessness, and a lack of emotional support. It also highlighted the fragility of human life and the need to openly address the challenges of mental health and addiction. On a personal level, the case has had a lasting impact on the lives of those involved. For Gregory's family, it represented unbearable pain and an ongoing battle for justice. For Christine, it marked the end of her freedom and the beginning of a new life behind bars. In conclusion, the case of Christine Rossum and the death of Gregory de Villers have left an indelible imprint on the community and judicial history. As time passes, the search for truth and the desire for justice continue to guide those touched by this tragic event, bringing with it the hope that one day the truth may finally fully emerge. The story of Christine Rossum and the death of Gregory de Villers has had a profound and lasting impact on the lives of everyone involved, leaving emotional scars and consequences that have extended over the years. For Christine, the first-degree murder conviction marked the end of her life as she knew it. She spent years behind bars, forced to confront the consequences of her actions and try to accept the reality of her situation. His struggle to prove his innocence and the burden of the sentence have inevitably affected his mental health and emotional well-being. For Gregory's family, the loss of a loved one in such tragic circumstances was unimaginable pain. They faced grief and anger as they searched for answers and justice for their beloved son and brother. Their fight for the truth has taken an emotional and financial toll, leaving indelible marks on their daily lives. For those involved in the search for truth and the pursuit of justice, the impact has also been significant. Investigators, lawyers, and members of the justice system faced unique challenges in trying to uncover the truth and ensure justice was done. Furthermore, Christine and Gregory's story raised broader questions about society and human nature. He highlighted the complexity of human relationships, the importance of transparency and integrity in the justice system, and the need to openly address mental health and addiction challenges. Ultimately, the impact of Christine and Gregory's story extends far beyond their individual lives, leaving an indelible mark on community and judicial history. As time passes, the search for truth and the desire for justice continue to guide those touched by this tragic event, bringing with it the hope of resolution and lasting healing for all involved. The story of Christine Rossum and the death of Gregory de Villers offers us an opportunity to reflect on a number of important issues and lessons learned that can be applied in everyday life and in the justice system. First and foremost, this story reminds us of the importance of thoroughly investigating and carefully examining all available evidence before drawing definitive conclusions. It is crucial to avoid rushing to judgment or being influenced by bias, and instead conduct objective and impartial investigations to ensure the truth comes to light. Second, Christine and Gregory's story highlights the critical role of transparency and integrity in the justice system. It is essential that all parties involved, from law enforcement to lawyers, from judges to jurors, act with honesty, professionalism, and respect to ensure a fair and just trial for all. Furthermore, this story highlights the importance of openly addressing mental health and addiction challenges. Christine and Gregory's story reminds us that these problems can have devastating consequences and that it is essential to offer support and resources to those who need it to prevent similar tragedies in the future. Finally, the story of Christine and Gregory teaches us that, despite the evidence and testimonies, the truth can be elusive and complex. It is important to keep an open mind and be willing to reconsider our beliefs based on new information and evidence that emerges over time. 
In conclusion, the story of Christine Rossum and Gregory de Villers offers us a number of valuable lessons that we can apply in our daily lives and in how we deal with the challenges and controversies we encounter. It is important to learn from this story to improve our justice system, promote justice, and prevent similar tragedies in the future. The affair of Christine Rossum and Gregory de Villers sparked widespread controversy, culminating in the court's decision that unleashed a series of significant consequences. The court's decision, which convicted Christine of first-degree murder, divided public opinion and raised questions about the validity of the evidence presented and the fairness of the sentence. Many disputed the strength of the case presented by the prosecution and suggested there were gaps in the investigation and legal arguments. This controversy had direct consequences on the lives of Christine and those involved. Christine was forced to spend years in prison, struggling to prove her innocence and facing the brunt of her sentence. Meanwhile, Gregory's family faced the pain of losing a loved one and the torment of uncertainty about truth and justice. Furthermore, the controversy had a broader impact on the justice system and public perception towards justice. It has raised questions about the transparency and integrity of the legal process, calling into question trust in the justice system and its key players. The consequences of the court's decision have spread over time, impacting the lives of those involved in the matter and leaving an indelible mark on the community. This case has served as a reminder of the need to conduct thorough investigations and ensure a fair and just trial for all parties involved so that the truth can emerge and justice can be done in a transparent and impartial manner.